Hello and welcome to What the Tech from Boast AI, where we talk with some of the brilliant minds behind new and exciting tech initiatives to learn what it takes to tackle technological uncertainty and eventually change the world. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome to the show Chris McCarthy, co-founder and CEO of Fansaves. Now, Fansaves is a sport tech startup and digital platform that offers fans discounts and deals from sponsors of their favorite sports teams and organizations. They provide partners with unlimited digital sponsorship inventory that is trackable through the Fansaves backend dashboard. Their product is unique in that it offers partners a true turnkey perk that can be added to their membership benefits while being fully integratable into team websites and mobile apps. This allows Fansave partners to drive fan traffic back to their own digital assets, helping drive engagement all year round. So as unique as the innovation that Chris is driving at Fansaves is, his journey into the startup space is just as interesting. Before entering the startup game, Chris spent seven years playing minor professional hockey while winning two championships before transitioning into the front office, serving as the director of sales for two minor professional hockey teams back in 2017. So needless to say, he's had a view into the world of professional sports from almost all angles. And I can't wait to pick his brain about what's in store for Chris, fan saves, and his take on the larger startup ecosystem as we dive headlong into 2024. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Chris. Yeah, Paul, thanks so much for having me. Really looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Yeah, so I know I gave a little bit of a primer on your background, but I'd love to hear from you. Where are you based? How did you get into the startup ecosystem in the first place? And really just tell me about that non-startup background too. I'm very interested to hear about all your experience so far. Yeah, definitely. Uh, based just outside of Cornwall, Ontario, so in between Ottawa and Montreal. But I grew up in Ottawa, you know, have a really unique career path. I always followed, like growing up, I played a high level of competitive hockey and, um, you know, always had dreams like every, every Canadian kid growing up playing in the NHL and came my draft year when I was 16. And, you know, I was like playing at a high level and ended up having a devastating knee injury, tore my ACL and uh, came back the next year stronger, but also like, had it got hit from behind and like blew my knee out again so that kind of shattered my dreams of playing in the nhl and i kind of looked stateside to go to school my parents were really pushing me you know to get my education so um i ended up going to a uh, community college in saranac lake in upstate new york did a year there with plans to go to uh, suny potsdam on a two-year program but um at the end of the year the coach left i ended up following him and he went to a prep school which was in lake placid um so kind of did a grade 13 postgraduate if you will and uh, was looking to get you know kind of like a partial scholarship sort of thing in the states um but that didn't materialize so i ended up going back home for a year played junior hockey and then um, actually applied to SUNY Potsdam in upstate New York, uh, where I attended university. But um, also that summer, I signed a contract to play minor pro hockey in this new league called the FHL. So a friend of mine started this new team and, you know, he owns a chain of Greek restaurants in Ottawa, which I was working for in the summer. So I actually signed my professional contract, my first professional contract in the back of a Greek on wheels restaurant. Shout out Greek <laughs> on wheels. So um, kind of a cool story there. But Ended up going to uh, to university for four years, playing world minor pro hockey throughout, which was a really unique thing. Um, a lot of the guys that I, I lived with at school played on the university team. And, you know, I was traveling back and forth between the cities I was playing. So a really unique experience, helped pay for my school. And um, after, after university, I got the opportunity to uh, transition into the front office. And that kind of opened my eyes to the opportunity of working for a professional sports team. And, you know, growing up an Ottawa Senators fan, diehard NHL Ottawa Senators fan, you know, I always thought there'd be an opportunity to work in the front office. Um, but throughout my experience in the front office and minor pro selling sponsorship, I ran into a pain point uh, selling sponsorship and with fan engagement. Um, and together, my now co-founder and I, you know, we decided to take a run at it. So that kind of led up to uh, what we're doing now. That is so cool. I love to hear too that you've had that competitive spirit from the start. And so maybe your NHL dreams didn't pan out for one reason or another, but you never lost that spirit. And that's more or less what's gotten you into the startup space and what's given you the drive to make fan saves what it is today. I'd love to hear a little bit more about Fan save specifically, you had mentioned a partner, I believe Shannon. I'd love to know how you guys met, how you guys kind of came together. What were the complementary skill sets even that you both brought to the table to make fan saves a reality? For sure. Um, I was actually playing in Cornwall, uh, Ontario, so I wasn't playing for the team. Um, and Shannon owned her own marketing company. She was doing some social media for the team. And there was one game, like, you know, maybe like a uh, third into the season, um, and a guy hit my goalie and I, I took him out behind the net. I actually broke my finger. I don't know if you can see that. I broke my finger in a fight. 
Um, so I was going to miss 11 weeks. I had uh, pins put in my finger. So I had experience in the front office. I went to the owner and, you know, told him I could really help on the sales side and, and the marketing side. So I became the sales and marketing director from that point on. And um, when I first met Shannon, our minds just melded. Like we were totally on the same page. And from that point on, we kind of took over all the sales and marketing for the team, um, you know, improved like ticket sales, sponsorship revenue. And in the off season, we were out selling sponsorship for actually two minor pro hockey teams, one in Watertown, New York, and one here in Cornwall, Ontario. And the same problem persisted. We were out selling sponsorship to these brands in our community and brands wanted more out of their sponsorship. They wanted something digital, something that could activate their fans while allowing them to collect customer analytics. And we didn't have anything like that. We left a lot of deals on the table because we couldn't satisfy that need that our partners wanted. And we had, we had brands like Boston Pizza, like giving us boxes of paper coupons. And, you know, they were a nightmare to hand out Little Caesars in Watertown. So, you know, we looked at this issue where like, you know, paper coupons can't track data. They're costly to produce. They're a nightmare to distribute. Challenges that are associated with paper coupons and traditional redemption methods. So talking to a lot of our like businesses and community and our partners, we said, you know, I think there's something here. And when we looked elsewhere in the industry, we found so many teams had the same problem. So you know, both having like that entrepreneurial mindset, we said, you know, what, let's take a run at this. I think there's something here. And seven years later, we're working with teams in over 24 leagues across North America, just partnered with NASCAR, recently backed by Comcast, NBC, and just on this incredible startup journey. So I'm so fortunate that I've got Shannon as my co-founder. We, As you mentioned, we really complement each other's skills. Um, and we're both so passionate about the business. So I think that's been a big thing that's really helped drive our success to date. Yeah, that is awesome. I think you've hit on a few key things too that I I'd like to just pull a thread on. Um, so that point about too how like you had signed your deal in the back of a Greek restaurant. It's so funny in the startup space because a lot of the times founders and their teams that they get together with, it is all about who you know. But then there's a the flip side of that coin too, which I think is more speaking to your and Shannon's relationship. Whereas you might have an idea, but you really got to look outside of the folks that maybe have been swimming in your circles the whole time to uncover that talent that's really going to bring your startup to the startup space. Get it from that idea phase into actually being something that will be in market, that will get revenue, that will get users. And it's not just theoretical what you can do. You're actually making a material impact. So it's great that you've had experience in kind of both of those realms, because I think some founders, they get very comfortable just sticking within, again, their, their crew or their circles that they know. And um, you got to have imagination and you also got to, again, have that energy and bravery. I mean, you're starting something new. You don't know the success. Even if there is a acute challenge that is across the industry, it, you got to be brave and you got to take some risks to get in there. So I'm glad that you and Shannon found each other. I'm also really glad to hear that it sounds like the best is yet to come with this NASCAR sponsorship, with Comcast backing you. That is all fantastic. I'd love to know now the platform itself. If you could tell me a little bit about what makes this such a unique innovation and how you guys are actually making such an impact that you are today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Fancy is a digital platform that offers fans discounts and deals from the sponsors of their favorite team. So you could think of it as a team's own digital coupon book or another way to look at it is think Instagram. On Instagram, you can follow as many pages as you want. Uh, but instead of seeing pictures that the team or organization is posting, um, the fan, you as the user can get access to discounts and deals provided by that team sponsor. So what we're really doing is connecting the fans with the sponsors of their favorite teams on a digital way that's trackable for both the sponsor um, for in-store redemptions, but also for the team to understand like how the fans are engaging with their corporate partners outside of the venue, which is a really, really difficult like data point to track currently. Um, teams are able to pull from social media metrics, um, eyeballs from in venue, but it's very difficult to actually prove that they drove business into their sponsors' establishments because of their partnership. So we track that ROI at the point of purchase, and that's what a really big you know part of our business is. Um, during the pandemic, we actually did a research study and we found that 40% of sports fans surveyed were more likely to support a business if they knew they were a sponsor of their favorite team. Yet 90% of sports fans couldn't name more than five of their favorite team sponsors. So that's a big problem for teams and for the brands that sponsor these teams. Like if the team's fans don't know who the partners are outside of the venue, they're much less likely to actually engage with them. And that's where we come in, not only 
um, you know, informing the fans who those sponsors are through our platform, but incentivizing them to engage with them through discounts and deals. Absolutely. And I think there's actually even more to that too, like just a discovery. For instance, I was looking at fan saves. I think I had mentioned this previously. I'm from the Boston area. We're a big sports town. I looked at what local teams were working with fan saves. I wasn't even fully aware that we had a minor league rugby team in my backyard. My mom lives outside of Quincy. That's where they are based. And I'm just looking. My sister played rugby in college. I love watching rugby. I had no idea I could go watch it live, let alone I could go to the gym at a 25% discount because they partner with that rugby team. And I have so many more access points too. I was just thinking this would have been great before Christmas, but I digress. So that function was one thing that I found super useful. Um, I actually found out about a sports team here that I didn't know that we had, and I would love to go support them. So I think that's another one. And then even your point about attribution. Love that you guys conducted that study. And I think it's a pain point across industries, not even in just the sports sector. I'm in marketing. You know this. Attribution is probably the hardest thing to tie back to and being like, okay, who took advantage of this program? When it's paper, coupons, you really can't track that. Now, I did want to dive into a little bit about how the mission has evolved. Just what have been some of the changes to fan save since you started seven years ago and today? And I know we had talked about some of the future facing things, but allude to that too. What else is on the roadmap for your evolution? Yeah, it's uh, we're we're gearing up for a big sales year. Uh, we more than doubled our sales year over year from last year, and you know, twenty twenty two is really our first sales year. So really excited about that. You know, in the sports industry is a really relationship based industry. There's a lot of like sports business events, sports tech events, and so you know, one thing that Shannon and I pride ourselves on is showing up, and we always have going to a lot of these events, meeting people in person, having a drink, and you know, just like building that relationship in person goes such a long way rather than you know, like trying to get to know someone over a thirty minute zoom call or you know so um that's something that you know on my side of the business as the co-founder i manage the sales uh business development strategy of the company um so that's something i'm really pa passionate about like my two biggest passions in life are, are business and, and sports so i'm super grateful that i get to combine both of those on a daily basis but um we have big plans for the platform one of the big pieces of innovation that we're working on right now that we'll be launching in q2 q3 is uh connecting our, our the sponsors with teams that we're working with. So right now we have 1500 brands, both national and local um, offering deals on our platform and, and over 80 partners. So um, as we continue to grow, we want to be the, the the middle person between the brands and the teams and organizations that we work with. So through our platform, a, a, a big brand could sponsor or you know, offer a, like create a deal campaign to one or multiple or many of our team partners that we're working with right across North America. So, um, you know, that's opens up a new revenue stream for us on like the, the brand side of things. Um, we're a B2B SaaS platform. So we make our, our money right now currently from our annual licensing fee from the teams and organizations. But um, that's a big piece of innovation uh, that we're working on. And then on the team side, um, you know, we just hired our, our 10th team member, including Shannon, myself. So, you know, just, I was thinking back like the other day, like to when Shannon and I just started this company with, it was just an idea and we just hired our 10th employee. So it's really cool to like see our team growth. And we're based just outside of Cornwall, like I mentioned, only about 20 minutes away from the Quebec border. But, and you know, there's, you know, strict language laws in Quebec and you have to respect the language. You know, we recently partnered with another tech company that helped us translate our platform. Um, and the hire that I just mentioned is a partnership success manager that's fully bilingual. So, um, you know, now we have the pieces to penetrate that market. And we've already partnered with four teams in the Quebec Maritime Junior Hockey League. So really excited about what's to come. But outside of North America, there's an enormous opportunity um, in sports. You think of like cricket in India and like soccer football in uh europe and um even baseball in japan so um really big opportunities there but the bigger vision is like everyone can be a fan of something so right now while we're hyper focused on professional sports it's where we started that's where a lot of our network lies um there's a lot of other types of verticals like um, membership organizations esports festivals events influencers athletes um, all these organizations and, and entities rely on sponsorship but they all have the same problem of justifying true ROI to their partners. So the bigger vision is when you come to fan saves, just like Instagram, you can follow anything that you're a fan of and you can actually not only see who the sponsors of that entity, that person, that you know organization are, but you can actually get 
uh, discounts and deals provided by the brands that are affiliated with them. It's fantastic. Now, I want to pull on one point that you started talking to you partnerships. So you did mention that you partnered with a tech uh, provider, if that's the right way of phrasing it. Yeah. Um, to help you with your innovation. Could you tell me a little bit about what these partnerships look like, what you're looking for when you're embarking on partnerships and how you define these working relationships? Yeah, so it, it really depends. Um I'll give a shout out to Let's Chat. They're uh, they're a tech AI platform that does translation services. They're rocking it. They're also a member of the Comcast NBC Sports Tech family, um, which we were a part of. Um, so a great tech partner there. But we also have um, some really other great tech partners in the sports tech space. Another great uh, company I'll give a shout out to is Vozzy. They do mass SMS texting campaigns. They work with so many major and minor teams across professional sports. Um, another great one is, is Dash fan engagement platform. They do like like digital jersey auctions um, and other, other great activations through their platform. So complementary to what we're doing, but also um, a lot of mutual clients. So we're able to work with each other, um, hit, help make introductions for each other, you know, and just open up doors where we can. So we see each other at a lot of the same events. Uh, we were just in Savannah, Georgia recently this past weekend at the uh, ECHL All-Star Game. And it's super great to catch up with, um, with these people every time we see them. And you know, we're all going on, we're all on the same journey and we're, you know, facing similar challenges. So, you know, not only is it great to see them succeeding, but it's also great to, you know, be able to talk about those challenges and kind of work them out together. So those are partnerships on like the tech side. And then, you know, we partner with teams, uh, like I mentioned, we're a B2B SaaS platform and we onboard the team sponsors. Um, and then the fans have access to those deals when they follow the team's page. Um, but like I said, you know, another great partner and, you know, investor in our company has been Comcast NBC. I'd be remiss if I didn't give them a huge shout out on this podcast because, you know, a uh, Fortune 30 company that sees the vision that we're building and um, they have an absolute massive platform and massive network. So it's opened up so many doors for us and it's just been an incredible experience going through that accelerated program. That is so cool. So actually, that was going to be my next question. Talking a little bit about your funding without given away too much. I'd love to know about how you guys have been funding your innovation to date. You had mentioned earlier, 2022 has kind of been your first sales year um, officially, but you guys started seven years ago and you've been building a really cool product in the meantime, and you haven't lost steam. So what has gone into kind of, if not bootstrapping, just making sure that you have everything you need to achieve the growth you want? Yeah. First five years, we bootstrapped our company. Like Shannon and I started this company. We, we like to joke with like, you know, a dollar or two in our bank accounts. I don't really, really remember how much it was back then, but it wasn't very much. Like it was, it was in the hundreds, maybe the tens. I don't know. Like we gotcha. were working on commission for the teams that we were working with. So, um, you know, we didn't have like that rich, rich, rich uncle or that, you know, big savings account to start the company. So, you know, a lot of times I hear founders what holds them back from starting their their company or executing on an idea is they don't have the funding they you know they don't know where to start so one thing that Shan and I have done I think really well has been really scrappy we like to consider ourselves like really scrappy founders you know there's one thing that Canada does really well is supporting and fostering early stage companies um, there's a lot of grant funding out there there's a lot of like support from the federal government to bring on new employees and um, you know there's a lot of like loans out there like uh, futurepreneur for example and, and bdc and you know cfdc so like we've been able to grow our company in those early days um we did a kickstarter campaign we we've, we've won multiple pitch competitions um even got like uh, a small line of credit from my dad you know like all these things we right. just we had to do to be really scrappy to reach our our vision that we always had um and then in 2023 at the beginning of 2023 um 2022, sorry, we got um, investment from a uh, family office here in, in the Cornwall area. And so they came across us because um, we're also a part of Invest Ottawa, Accelerator uh, based out of yeah. Ottawa. They've been amazing and helped us grow as well, too. But Shannon was asked to speak on a panel. Um, she you know, talked about her experience and growing up in Cornwall and starting a company there. And one of the um, a founder that was in the attendance, um, you know, her family was a part of a family office. So she reached out to Shannon, Shannon gave her some, you know, some tips and things like that. And it ended up turning into a conversation about investment. So, um, you know, they were looking to invest in like a female founded company in the Eastern Ontario region. And it just happened to be that we were that. So 
what I would say uh, also is like, if you don't put yourself out there, there's less opportunities for you to be discovered. And like I mentioned earlier, we show up and we always say yes to opportunities that really make sense to us. So um, getting that family office to invest in our, as our pre-seed investors was huge for us. Um, allowed us to really grow over the last two years and increase our, our annual recurring revenue. And then we applied to the Comcast Sports Tech Accelerator. And um, out of 920 applications uh, from across the world, uh, we were selected as one of 10 sports tech companies to be accepted into the program and the only Canadian company um, out of the 10. So that was something that we were really proud of. And now to have Fortune 30 company on our cap table not only gives us like a huge amount of confidence as founders but you know when we're pitching to other investors like we've got that card in our hand that we can drop and you know it's like instant credibility and such a huge network they've been such great mentors to us and you know all the other companies that have gone through the program over the past three years it's been in existence as well really great peer uh peer opportunities to again like i mentioned connect with other founders you know share challenges have them on our podcast as well. And um, just, you know, we're all in the same, same journey, but different paths. So it's, I cannot say enough good things about them. I would scream it from the mountaintops. Um, Comcast has been incredible. I'll say it again. Comcast has been incredible, everybody. I scream it from the mountaintops. <laughs> One thing that I love that keeps coming up too um, in your responses is that you and Shannon are in person. You're going there. You are meeting with people. You are making those connections. It's not the same necessarily in the funding a startup world where I live in Boast, but we go to all the shows. We have a physical presence with the people that we're trying to work with. In our case, it's founders. It's a lot of entrepreneurs who are just trying to find the resources, not even capital resources, just knowledge to get their ideas off the ground. And you can have a million Zoom calls. Some of them will be great. Email chains, same. A lot can be learned there. But when you're in person on the floor, even if it's at like the Eaton Center and it's a huge Elevate Festival or something like that, you're going to learn so much. And you're also just going to make a more memorable connection. And you're going to find people like those family offices who want to invest in some really cool innovation. I mean, it happens organically there. I can't emphasize enough. We were on a road show over the course of the summer. I was exposed to more people than I had in my entire career who I feel like we could really work together and make an impact. And I think that's an amazing strategy specifically for fan saves too. And I love that you guys are doing that. Another point I want to bring back too is you had mentioned you guys are scrappy. Absolutely. But you're also being very smart and very tactical here. Like you had said, the Canadian government has so much funding they want to put into innovation. Of course, there's a lot of politicking that goes on and a lot of election cycles and promises made and things like that. But by and large, I am so blown away from my seat here in Boston at how much Canada is giving to founders to help fuel their innovation. You had mentioned Futurepreneur, you had mentioned a few of the programs, but even just like the IREP program as a baseline, huge. That is fantastic. We have SBIR here in the States. They're not a one-to-one -one necessarily, but it's just it's just so supportive in a way that I don't think I've been exposed to elsewhere. And even those accelerators and incubator programs that you had mentioned, I met a lot of the folks from Invest Ottawa up at SAS North a few weeks ago, months ago. It's January. Wow. Um, so I met them. Such great and such supportive folks. And I think it's a combination, again, of that kind of just hunger and real like energy that I think is seen within the athlete world and also within the entrepreneur world. But also it's something uniquely Canadian. The community really, really likes helping each other out up there. And um, it, it's fantastic. I can't not give a shout out to, to the Shred program. Obviously, that's both bread and butter. But I mean, what's so awesome about that, and I'm not going to throw shade to the US because we also have an R&D tax program, but it is money that innovators are spending themselves and they deserve to recoup, to double down on that innovation and to literally just put back in, you'll get even more shreddable activities by taking advantage of shred. It's a virtuous cycle. So that's just some advice to founders out there too, whether or not you're taking advantage of the shred program today, it is something I can't recommend higher enough. It's gonna play at a different stage in your startup life cycle than the grant programs will. You do have to kind of take advantage of those grants, I think at the start to get off the ground, but all of it is there. And to your point earlier, you got to be scrappy and you got to just go for it. Similarly with the Comcast Accelerator too, go for it. Don't leave any stone unturned here. It's important to you and you want to get that funding. 
And I just want to echo something that you said there, like shred it, shred um, funding. Like it's so important to us. And like, you know, again, like shout out to our pre-seed investors. They've been amazing partners and so supportive of us. Um, so not only them, but like even investors that we, we speak to, we make a point of saying like, if you give us a dollar, we'll stretch that dollar. And like with shred funding, like we can enhance that, that funding so that we can come back to the company, that money that we're spending uh, on innovation. So I, like I couldn't re recommend it any more like than you than you can. It's it's such an important part of our business. Um, and yeah, it goes hand in hand with like the, the grant funding and you know a lot more investors are in Canada are, are generally more conservative. Um, we've been talking to a lot more like American investors for like you know additional higher rounds like you know seed and Series A. We've been building those relationships, but sure. um, you know I, I always talk when I talk to American founders. I always like praise like the government's like ability to help startup founders at that early stage. Um, and there's so many like interest holders involved with that, like, you know, um, accelerators, we've been a part of a few of those, like I mentioned and pitch competitions that give early mm -hmm. stage founders, um, you know, the opportunity to present their platform or, you know, their business, uh, and you know, have to, you know, have to pay it's free advertising. That was one of the strategies that we did early on. Um, we've been a part of over 50 pitch competitions. We've won multiple of them and every one that we go to, we, in, you know, we're introduced to someone that can help our business, whether that's an advisor, a new client, um, a partner, like, so if anyone's listening out there, definitely like three strategies that have really helped us grow, especially in those early, like three to five years, um, getting on podcasts, just like this, you know, getting your brand out there, repping, but also sharing uh, content that can help other people. Um, and like your LinkedIn strategy is something that I'm very passionate about and documenting our journey. Pitching, so many opportunities out there, both like local, regional, national, and international. Like we went to Berlin, Germany and pitched at the Get in the Ring International Pitch Competition representing Canada because uh, we won the regional competition here in, in Ottawa, um, but also accelerator programs. Like every accelerator program is a community. It's a community of founders, interest holders, um, investors. And we've been fortunate enough to be a few, part of a few of those programs. So those are just a few things that have like helped us grow during the early stages. Um, and we have a lot of growth strategies for beyond, but um, if anyone's listening out there, you're just starting your business or you're looking for, you know, help. Um, those are some, some strategies I would definitely recommend. Absolutely. And again, to your point about exposure, that is an awesome way to get bro broader brand exposure, but also just exposure with the communities that you want to be involved in. And I'm also going to echo that point you had made earlier about Shred and just applying for all the grant funding. When you get to that next stage of growth and you're looking for some investors, they're going to want to know that you're being smart about your costs, that you are stretching that dollar as far as it can go. When they give you money, it's not being wasted. It is going to be recouped if it can be, and it's going to double down on driving innovation. And I think that if it's something you're not taking advantage of, that's going to be glaring because they're going to be like, hey, well, I mean, there's still money out there and you don't have to hand over equity yet if you don't want to. I mean, they won't might not say that to you, but I think that's kind of the inkling. So just echoing that again, take advantage of it all. Apply for those pitch competitions, apply for those programs, get that exposure at that early phase. And again, you might find people who might even want to join the organization. The DNA of your team might change in the process, but it'll be for the better, I think, in a lot of those situations. So I love all of that. What is your take on the current state of startups? And just what are some strategies beyond, again, applying for all those programs? taking part in all the pitch competitions, getting that exposure, but strategies for startups or founders who may be apprehensive going into 2024, given headlines are frequently doom and gloom about the economy and about the state of funding and about VC generally. I know you had mentioned it earlier too. Canada is known to be a little more conservative. People look offshore, but what are some words of wisdom, I think, for folks who might be a little worried going into the new year? Some of the biggest companies have come out of like downturns and recessions. So, I mean, like, just do it, just start, you know, like what you don't know, like you'll figure out along the way, the common like analogy is like you jump out of the, the airplane without a parachute and you figure it out on the way down, or you figure out how to launch a parachute on the way down. I think that's really true. Um, I think there's so much happening around AI, which is a really cool space. Um, the sports tech industry where, where we swim, lots of exciting innovation happening teams that have done things so long the traditional way are looking to like enhance digital platforms ai data caption uh capture is so important to understand all aspects of the business and 
you know, for sponsors to be uh, more informed on like how their dollars are being spent. So um, those are just a couple of like industries I can speak to, but it's, it's really exciting. It's a really cool community to be a part of. There's so much, um, there's so much help out there. There's so many people um, that are there to support you. And um, it's like such an incredible rewarding journey. I'm just so blessed that like, you know, I came across, Shannon, my now co-founder in this pain point that we're solving. And we've been on this incredible journey together and um, it's just been so rewarding. So my, my two cents, my word of advice would be like, if you have an idea out there, just start, you know, doom and gloom side of things is like 80% of businesses fail and like startup life is not for everybody. But at the end of the day, it's like I said, like the most rewarding thing I've done in my life and um, I couldn't be happier. Yeah. And you got to take that risk. And just to echo your point too, I think there will always be an excuse to not start there. You can always point to a challenge in the economy or a challenge in the larger, larger ecosystem that you can be like, Oh no, well, not even going to try. Just do it. Just try. There's always going to be that doom and gloom. It's always kind of the headline. At least that's been my experience working in the industry for the past few years. Um, it always seems like there's some kind of, tragedy on the horizon, but no, businesses still make it happen. And some really, really cool innovation has come about. Uh, now you had mentioned also about getting that exposure on podcasts. Now I know I'm not the only podcaster in the room. Give me a little bit of details about the show you guys have going over there. Yeah. Back in 2020, like, you know, everything shut down in sports. Our teams weren't playing, businesses were closed and, you know, everyone was sheltered at home. No one was out spending money. And so we didn't have a lot of content to share. So we had talked about it for, you know, a year or so about creating our podcast. And um, we had created a brand previously called Living the Startup where, you know, we we had a blog and, you know, we featured like, you know, the documenting the journey, startup life, the wins, losses, and the lessons learned along the way. So we decided to start this podcast as a way to connect with other founders and help share their journey, but also like peel back a layer of, uh, peel back the curtain of startup life and kind of just learn from other entrepreneurs and their experiences, but also be able to share their stories. So um, started small, you know, we did the, all the editing ourselves. We didn't really do a ton of editing. We love the authentic authenticity of the ums and ahs and, you know, the, you know, the different, um, you know, way people speak and stuff like that. But, um, you know, about 10 episodes in, we partnered with Staples Canada and they become like a great partner of our podcast, sharing our content, uh, but also featuring us on their website. And so that really gave us a lot of confidence and credibility towards the podcast. And since then, we were up to like uh, over 80 episodes now uh, where we've been able to feature great founders. And, you know, a lot of times we were introduced to founders or they reach out to us or whatever, and we get on a call and, you know, there's no synergy between our businesses, but, you know, we're all in, on a, a different journey, but facing similar challenges. So it's really cool to like be able to, you know, offer them a platform where we can share their story and kind of like also learn from their experiences as well too. So um, yeah, great way to create content. We still put out episodes almost on a weekly basis, but um, you know, if anyone's interested in learning more about that, you can check out Living the Startup. Um, we're right now we're on SoundCloud, but we're, we're migrating over to Anchor and um, all the major channels. But um, yeah, it's been a, a really cool, like so, kind of side project that turned into something that's given our company credibility and, you know, people come across the podcast and they're like, Oh, what's fancy. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely something I think anybody can do if you're, you know, an expert on a topic or if you're opinionated or if you have great energy uh, like yourself, um, it's always cool to talk to other founders. Absolutely, Chris. Yeah, I'm going to say it again. Anyone listening to this podcast will want to listen to Living the Startup. It's some inspiration that we got when we embarked on What the Tech to begin with. So I can't thank you enough for joining us for this episode and for coming on to our show. But again, all of our audience, there are so many resources that you can find over on that feed. So I'll be sure that there is a link in the show notes too for everybody to subscribe. But Chris, this has been fantastic. I cannot thank you enough. No, uh, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, exactly, just like yeah. if anyone wants to learn more about my story or, you know, I'm always happy to talk to other founders or students and kind of give them my perspective and experience on our journey. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn, very active on the platform and pushing out content. But um, if you want to check out Fansaves, fansaves.com, we're on all the social platforms um, and download the app if you want to check out some, some sports teams in your area. Awesome stuff. I love it, Chris. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Again, I'll make sure there's links to everything that Chris just mentioned in the show notes too, but I'm so excited for what Fan Saves is going to be up to in 2024 and can't wait to watch along. And again, listen on Living the Startup. 